Yeah, my name is John Centineo from UW Sims. So Mike Pavlonis is the PI on this project, but um, it's definitely a collaborative effort. So I'm one of the uh, co-developers for the NOAA Sims Prop Severe model. So in this presentation, we're going to show how Prop Severe accomplishes what the title says, from big data to actionable information. So like I said, this is a collaborative effort. Um, we have a partner out in Boulder, Dan Lindsay of Noah Nesda Star, myself, um, colleagues at UW Sims, Justin Sigliff, who's on a call with us today, Jordan Gers, Lee Kranz, and um, a student at the AOS department here, Eric Loken. So we're definitely in an era of big data. Our observation systems are becoming more numerous with larger domains, greater spatial temporal resolution, and uh, just more capabilities in general. So not only are we collecting large volumes of data, but we have to process that. Just collecting doesn't directly address the, uh, any given hazard. We have to still distill the mountains of data into useful information for decision makers. So that's where you guys come in. Now, as you guys all know, severe weather is very common in the United States, and the National Weather Service has many very important responsibilities, but I would argue that for the eastern two-thirds of the CONUS, severe weather warning is one of the most important responsibilities that you have. So that includes warning for um, hazards such as strong wind, large hail, and tornadoes, of course. So that's where Prop Severe comes in. Now, what is it? It's basically a statistical model that will predict the probability that a storm will first produce severe weather in the near term. That's really how it was designed on the, um, the front end of uh, severe weather. So it wasn't designed to predict if a storm will continue to pose a severe threat or if the storm will decay, though in testing with forecasters at the HWT the past two years, They've often used it as such and found utility using it that way for um, um, certain storm modes. But really it was designed and evaluated as what we call a pre-polygon product. Okay, so how do we convert the big data to information? Well, we're really fusing together different data sets available from NWP models, um, time trends and goes derived uh, cloud products, and of course some uh, radar intensity metrics. So we combine this, and using the statistical model can generate a probability that a developing thunderstorm will produce severe weather. The storm environment information right now comes from the rapid refresh model, and we use the NWP to make just a first order approximation of the storm environment. So we use this using some instability and shear parameters. For shear, we use the effective bulk shear, which normalizes well between storms with um, deep and shallow inflow layers and is more accurate when you're looking at uh, elevated convection. And for instability, we just use the most unstable CAPE since it really provides a generous estimate of instability. So you can see this is these are very much uh, first order NWP predictors. It's really, they're just meant to get us in the right ballpark of um, the probability of severe weather. So one important note about the use of the NWP data is that we don't just use a single forecast or analysis. We make a temporal composite over several forecast fields and analysis grids, and then use a spatial smoother on that composite. So in this way, we can help mitigate NWP phase and placement errors in timing of uh, fronts and things like that. So the last thing we want is for some really poor NWP solution to squash the model probabilities. We assume if there's convection observed on satellite or radar that there has to be adequate CAPE. Okay, so for the satellite cloud growth predictors, we're using what's called a normalized vertical cloud growth rate and a glaciation rate. 
past research has shown that, that we conducted, um, how quickly the developing storm cools is an in infrared brightness temperature is an indicator of the severe potential. So here's an example in eastern Kansas where we see some rapid cooling in the imagery, and but we can quantify that cooling with a computer. So the cooling rate is normalized such that the seasonal and latitudinal and um, surface variation differences um, are automatically accounted for. So it's, it's very analogous to brightness temperature cooling, but um, in a normalized sense. The other satellite predictor that we use is the glaciation rate. So basically, how quickly is the cloud top transitioning from liquid water to uh, ice crystals? So the liquid water in this animation is the uh, light blue, and ice is orange, red, and gray. So similarly to the normalized vertical growth rate, the computer quantifies this information, how quickly it's developing and transitioning from mostly water to mostly ice. And what we found is that that's an indicator of uh, future severe potential. Now, what we're trying to do is link development observed from satellite that often occurs before robust radar signatures to um, what's happening with intensification of radar. And you that fire that says something about developing storm on radar and, and its future severity. But for the radar, we're using the multi-radar, multi-center products, or MRMS, um, developed at NSSL, but it's now transitioned to NSF operations. So the MRMS fields are a conus-wide composite using all the individual NEXRAD uh, radars. And MRMS really helps fill the gaps in single site coverage. So it helps mitigate code of silence issues and can offer increased sampling frequency when you have um, multiple radars sampling the storm. So it updates every two minutes with at least some new information on most storms. So However, if you have an area where it's only single radar coverage, let's say north central uh, Minnesota, then you won't reap these benefits. But for the eastern two-thirds of the country, the multiple radar coverage is pretty good. So the radar product that we're using as a predictor is the maximum expected size of hail. And um, that's derived from the severe hail index, which is just a thermally weighted vertical integration of reflectivity above the melting level. So we're really trying to capture the ice content in the storm. And we also utilize the composite reflectivity just for radar storm uh, cell identification and tracking. So a meteorologist doesn't see um, pixels or satellite radiances when it looks at imagery. He sees developing storm, storm clouds and um, satellite imagery or the reflectivity and, and radar data. So that's what we're trying to mimic with our automated identification and tracking. Um, again, the same thing is true for radar data. The computer needs to identify and track the cells and their evolution. So we're automatically identifying tracking, and also applying a parallax correction to these storms observed by radar and satellite all at once. And linking the different scales of uh, identification together, we can then automatically extract information from gridded fields within the spatial bounds of these identified objects. And these are the metrics used in the, um, the predictors used in, in Prob Severe. So I just want to give you a feel for what the processing looks like and how all this data is coming in uh, together. And this is just 30 minutes. So basically, um, at the top of the hour, we get some new rapid refresh grids from NSEP. Every two minutes, we have the MRMS fields. And in rapid scan operations, roughly every seven and a half minutes, we have new uh, GOES data. So you can see the input data counter ticking up but note in the bottom right, the output file size at each time stays about the same, which is usually just around 200 kilobytes or less. So this is 
the file that AWIPS2 uses to render and display the props of your data. So just scaling that up to one hour, our input is about 1,200 megabytes, but our output is uh, roughly three orders of magnitude smaller at just 200 kilobytes per, per file. And we'll have 30 output files for one hour since the model computes whenever a radar scan comes in. When we add GOZAR and all of the data that that provides, we'll have a seven-fold increase in input data. And, and then if we tack on to HER, you're almost at an order of magnitude of input. And we still will probably have just about a 200 kilobyte output file. So and these estimates are just basically assuming the data we're using right now, it's um, just scaled up for higher resolution. It doesn't even take into account the new data that we're planning on including with some more spectral bands, more NWP drive fields, dual pole variables, and some total lightning data. So you can really see how Probsevere is trying to find a coherent, pertinent signal in this just increasingly large ocean of uh, useful data out there. So here's a slide on the uh, display for Probsevere. So one thing that I really learned at HWT the last couple of years is that forecasters prize their AWS2 screen space, and rightfully so. Their, their screen real estate is really precious during warning operations, and of course, radar is the pro predominant tool used. So, so that's why the Prop Severe display is really meant to complement and enhance the forecaster's warning operations. Um, the model output by default is displayed in two ways. One is this probability contour with a color enhancement designed to overlay on top of uh, radar reflectivity color tables, but it could really be overlaid anything. So the, the shape file nature makes it really flexible in AWIPS2. And additionally, we have the probability in each model predictor displayed when uh, sampling is turned on. So just this first field here, of course, is the sphere of probability. Um, zero to 100 percent. Second is the most unstable cape, and the um, next one is the effective shear. Fourth bullet is the instantaneous uh, mesh in inches and the time that it occurred. And the next two are the satellite growth predictors, so the maximum um, satellite vertical growth rate when it occurred, and um, the value, but we realize that the values aren't super pertinent to you guys because you're not familiar with what's a, what's a strong value as you might be for, say, mesh. So we tacked on these classifiers at the end as weak, moderate, or strong um, just based on some statistical thresholds. So the other thing to note is that for these two satellite predictors, the normalized vertical growth rate and the glaciation rate, that we're using the maximum value in the storm's lifetime. So it may have occurred an hour before or more, but we're still using that information with the um, associated radar object or objects. OK, so now I'm going to transition to some examples from this year's and last year's HWTs of how forecasters have been using the Prod Severe model. So this is just one from May, I think, in uh, Texas, where basically the, um, there was some pulsing convection in Lubbock CWA. And the forecaster here wasn't really sure which ones were going to be the ones to uh, uh, pulse back up, if any. So seeing the prob severe probabilities, which were much higher on the two storms to the right, helped increase her confidence in uh, issuing the warning. So this is another one in far south Texas where um, you have some rapidly developing convection and you're at a range pretty far from the radar. I want to say this lowest tilt was over 10,000 feet high. So what the forecaster said there was that the normalized vertical growth rate and the glaciation rate were both strong. So in this case, he was confident enough to use the prop severe by itself to issue a severe thunderstorm warning. And he started drawing the prob severe polygon prior to the highest percentage coming out. In the end, his polygon was issued nearly coincident with the highest uh, probabilities. And if you look at the animation, it's also coincident with the uh, three-body scatter spike. 
Um, another forecaster, when we were working in Florida, thought it was very useful for some collapsing thunderstorms in central Florida. So again, kind of a pulse environment. Probabilities were kind of ramping up quickly, but also ramping down. And at that time, the forecaster said that this demonstrates that Prop Severe might be useful not only for growing thunderstorms, but for collapsing thunderstorms and their associated risk of strong winds as well. So he didn't focus directly on the, um, just the probability, but he used other environmental information and what regime he was in and just kind of in his um, model of what would happen on that day, used all that information with Severe to add some confidence in um, detecting these collapsing thunderstorms for wind threats. And there were some marginally severe, I think, hail and wind reports in Florida that day. So this was out in Idaho. So a forecaster said that in about a five-minute span, the cell highlighted um, in blue showed a severe potential of only 20 percent, but increased to 89 percent and produced a reported one-inch hail. So that's one thing that forecasters have really seemed to pick out is that the, um, the rate of change in the probability itself really indicates some uh, development in the storm, whether it be in the radar or it continued satellite growth that really jumps the probabilities, and that makes them take notice. A couple other examples where forecasters would uh, include storms in the expansion of warning polygons. So I think in the left example, they said the radar data was really unremarkable, but the probability was high enough, and they'd used it enough to trust it that it, they needed to include it in, the, uh, in their warning polygon. And they've also used an expiration of warning polygons, so whether to continue it or to um, yeah, just expire the polygons if the probability really is decreasing, it looks like the storm isn't, isn't just dying off. Just another example of using the jump in the probability forecaster noted that it jumped from 36 to 88 percent at uh, 50, from 52, 0052Z to 56. And just a few minutes later, there was a three-body scatter spike, so there was certainly some lead time showing up on that feature. And this was just an example from yesterday where, so one other product they were evaluating was this uh, total lightning information from Earth Networks. And this is up in Minnesota where it might be a, due to a detection efficiency problem where it's lightning just really went to basically zero. But the forecaster noted that the initial warning was based on a 90% prop severe, according to the NOSIMS model. So this was useful, extremely useful, since we had little situ awareness, situational awareness there since we just started, but had enough trust in it. And a quick glance at the radar confirmed it was probably onto something. So it helps give them a nearly 20-minute lead time in that case. So this is just another case from last year in Ohio. But basically, the take home for us was the, uh, the culmination of the survey questions from last year. So when asked, would you use the prop severe model output during warning operations at your WFO if it were available, I think 98% of respondents, which was about 60, said they would. So that was super encouraging to us. Also, nearly 75% of forecasters said it increased confidence in issuing warnings, and nearly 50% said it increased lead time to severe hazards. So like all automated algorithms, um, it also has weaknesses. It's not all just, it's not the best thing since uh, slight spread, but it works well in a number of cases. So here's just an example where the forecaster noted that it might be geared more towards forecasting large hail threat um, using available instability parameters, especially when the satellite information isn't available. So the model will still run when you have um, when you don't have sat observed satellites, and maybe there's a, just a really large shear cirrus shield, but um, I'm saying it's probably not super skillful in some of these events. So when you're not getting really strong updrafts, the predictors don't really um, capture any other uh, development you can see on radar from wind. There's not really any velocity-derived metrics in there yet. So in some cases, it might struggle with uh, strong winds. Also, several forecasters have 
noted that they would like to see the product um, follow the stronger cells in an embedded squall line, so thus breaking up some of those predictor values and getting more discrete guidance. So we're really working on ways to do this discrimination better while maintaining low product latency since our identification and tracking is kind of um, linked to uh, latency. So there's trade-offs. If we want to have better identification and tracking, then we'll have to add more processing time, which hurts latency. But we're definitely working on ways to do that and, mit and still have a good uh, uh, latency. Okay, so now I'm going to transition to some uh, evaluation we did from last year. So our evaluation used over, or about 9,000 storms, 860 were severe, and those were uh, manually identified by our student worker, Eric Loken, who, who was really, did an awesome job, just uh, had a great attention to detail, so we're really thankful for his work here. So this is just a reliability diagram. Basically, it gives us the, um, the probability that there was a severe LSR or, uh, or an NWS warning given a certain forecast probability bin. I should note that these, this is the first LSR or the first warning. So it's really, again, just evaluated to the front end of the severe hazards. And you can see that it's fairly well calibrated. Um, there's, of course, some, a bit of over-forecasting or maybe over-confident -for forecasts, but we're, we've been pretty pleased with the reliability, and we're still working out ways to make it more reliable, so when you do get an 80%, that it does verify 80% of the time. We also did a analysis or evaluation versus the National Weather Service for these initial LSRs. And you can see if you look at the CSI plot that, no surprise, the NWS skill is better than a, an automated algorithm for a, uh, severe weather warnings. But um, one thing to know if you look at the far right is that the um, median lead time for prob severe was 29 minutes, where the NWS was about 19 minutes. So, where prob severe lacks in overall skill, it can still add some increased lead time, which might be important for a lot of your users. Um, but going back to the skill, it's still in the right, in the ballpark. It's not, it's, um, we were pretty happy that the CSI was about 0.32 or so. The green bars here are just the prop severe without satellite, so you can kind of quantify the satellite's contribution. In terms of total skill, it's um, pretty much a wash, but it definitely uh, doubles the uh, lead time from uh, five to 10 minutes, so we think it's pretty important in, in that respect. And we definitely fully expect that the impact of the satellite component will be even greater when we have Gozar in orbit. We'll have more frequent images, much better spatial resolution, and just more spectral bands for um, inferring information from cloud properties. And the total lightning mapper, I think, will be a really big uh, uh, game changer for severe weather warning. This is just a summary of some uh, feedback we've gotten in the last two years. Um, we really think that prop severe is a useful tool to forecasters as is, but one thing I really want to stress is that there's going to be a lot of development in the next couple of years. Current model is just one small step in providing this integrated warning guidance to uh, forecasters. Forecasters have noted that it helps highlight the storms to watch and interrogate further with all tilts radar. It um, helps prioritize threats good for discrete storms, and uh, it still has utility after the initial threats. Forecasters like watching the trends or, or the jumps in the probability, uh, can add lead time on some storms, and they really like the display. Some of the weaknesses is that in some linear wind events, it tends to struggle, um, has low probabilities on low topped convection, and one thing forecasters noted is that there's really no tornado genesis predictor, so no rotational uh, velocity predictors. They wanted to see more readout when you scroll over and 
forecasters really want the individual hazard prediction, which is what the next couple of years of, of development will focus on. And like one of the blog posts mentioned, they want some better discrimination in squall lines. So where do we go from here? Well, in part, we do what forecasters are already doing. So this was part of a blog post from forecasters at HWT where they were using the all-tilts radar, prob severe, overshooting top detection, lightning jump algorithm, all in conjunction for their warning decision. Forecasters use all sorts of useful inf information in a subjective manner to make those warning decisions. But prob severe is just trying to put an objective probability on what the data tell the forecaster. So different tools and observations are useful in different situations, so we want to make prob severe um, adaptable to the observations coming in. Total lightning information, additional NWP and radar fields, OT, OT detection, and some other storm top information, we think could really help increase the utility of prob severe in those different situations. I want to focus on this top right panel where the forecaster has prob severe contours overlaid the um, fee probabilities. So we're not doing this development in a vacuum. It's not just us. We're really leveraging feedback from the HWT forecasters, um, local proven ground experiments, and leveraging research out of Boulder, total lightning research out of Huntsville, Alabama. And we have a funded collaboration with some folks at NSSL in Norman. And part of that collaboration is that prob severe is being tested as automated probabilistic warning guidance in the, in the fee uh, project, which is a key component into facets. So you can see that forecasters at the HOUT were able to view these very experimental gridded threat swaths in their um, AWIPS 2 terminals. This is just um, where warning operations is potentially headed. This is one um, direction for uh, what we'll see in the future. So there's all sorts of new and promising data sets that will have a positive impact on severe weather warning operations. But we feel that linking together the pertinent aspects of these data will only improve the performance of the prop severe model and give forecasters more confidence, situational awareness, and lead time to severe hazards. There's all these um, convection allowing models and good uh, mesoscale guidance from things like the HER, the SHREF. Um, have I noted some positive aspects of GOZAR with super rapid scan, the global light or a uh, geostationary lightning mapper, or shooting top detection and some other storm top uh, indices that might be useful with a better spatial resolution. And uh, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of what dual pull products and some MRMS products can uh, give us. But one thing but um, one thing I want to stress is that all this takes time. We can't just stick in any and every data set and hope it'll work. A uh, statistical model is only as good as its training, so we really have to be diligent. Many forecasters have voiced the desire to see the probabilistic forecast tailored to each hazard. So that's what we're hoping to do with this funded collaboration um, with NSSL as well as with uh, the GOZAR program. Just to wrap up, the prob severe can increase lead time and confidence of warnings to initial severe weather hazards. It's a good quick look product that condenses information and focuses the forecaster's attention, displays nicely and easily over radar with scroll over, readout, if the forecasters want that. And it's skillful as is, but we feel that the performance should only increase with more development. The Prob Severe plugin is baselined in AWIPS 2 version 14.4. And until your offices upgrade, you can visit the web page listed at the top here, which has a Google Maps interface and scroll over capability, much like what you would see in AWIPS 2. And the web page is pretty much real time. It might be a few minutes uh, displaced from what you would see in AWIPS 2. It also links to blog posts and um, some published papers if you want to read the nuts and bolts of the model, and some uh, training materials that we give to forecasters at HWT. So 
the last thing I just want to stress is please don't hesitate to send us any emails at all if you have general questions or comments or see something from a specific case either in your office or um, that you see online on the website. We really love hearing from the operational community. So with that, thank you all for joining in, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, John. Uh, any questions uh, for them on Prob Severe? Hey, John. Uh, this is Pat Spoden at Paducah. Um, how is the archive of this? Uh, for instance, we had a case a few days ago. Can I email you and, and get the prob severe, or is there anywhere on the web where I can uh, go back and look at previous cases? Um, unfortunately, the web archive, we don't really have that capability. With the website, I think you can go back up to two or three days, but we do save off data, usually you know during May, June, July, August, so we can definitely look at that for you and send you some uh, screen captures or something like that if you want to email us. Yeah, certainly. Okay, great. Thanks. Hey, this is uh, Ken of Wichita with a question. Yep. I was looking at your statistics uh, against um, some with the LSRs. I was wondering if you had gone back at, back and compared it to the actual warning decisions that were made at the offices to see whether the warnings were issued, um, you know, comparing them to when the warnings were issued with uh, those offices to see how the warning decisions have been altered. So you're asking if the forecasters have used Prop Severe and how they've yeah, when they used the prob severe, would you, did you mm -hmm. compare that event with the one that was at the actual office to see um, were your forecasters there able to issue warnings faster uh, with larger oh. lead times, more accuracy, this type of oh. thing than the than mm -hmm. the ones at the native office where the event was ongoing? Yeah, we don't have any statistics on that. Um, the forecasters at the HWT weren't really; they were discouraged from looking at the um, real-time official warnings from NWS offices. So um, once in a while they would cheat and peek and see, you know, like, oh, I beat that office on this warning or something, or sometimes it's after. So we don't have any good uh, statistics on that. But also there's just not, basically just a couple offices have been using it, I think, somewhat regularly. So we don't have a lot of uh, a large sample for that either right now. Yeah, that would be interesting to look at. The follow-up on what Phil was saying is, Phil, you were asking basically is there a control group <laughs> and see if there was any uh, improvement on lead time. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering is, is if, so you have the prob severe there at the hazardous weather test bed, and they're issuing warnings at, for like Wichita where we do not use it. Um, and we have an event ongoing here. How much better did the forecasters down at the hazardous weather test bed issuing warnings for the event in Wichita, did they improve over <clears throat> what our office here in Wichita did not using it? That's kind of what I'm interested in. This is Justin, one of the developers that works with John. Just We kind of talked about that when I was down at HWT. and, and I think what you're describing would be a really neat experiment. And but when the forecasters down at the HWT, they're basically told not to go full pressure and worry about every storm and every CWA. More, they you know they're doing these blog posts, kind of d documenting what they're looking at, why they're looking at, what they're thinking. So I, I think to do that and to do that fairly, I think they would ne need to. I think the experiment would need to be a bit different in that instead of doing the blog posts about you know that kind of thought process and, and work kind of flow, what they're looking at, is to do exactly what you described. So I think that would make for an interesting experiment. Yeah, I'm just curious to see, uh, you know, when we come up with these new, uh, uh, you know, ideas and things and we go before we deploy them to see where we can put some metrics to it just so, and it goes a long way to a lot of things, um, uh, forecaster buy-in, justification of further science research. And I'm just always have an interest in that. So that's why I asked the question. But thank you for your response. I appreciate that. And thank you for the work that you're doing. 
Thanks. This is Daniel in Omaha. I can say a couple things about that. You know, I guess I've been looking at Prob Severe for a little over a year, and we have it in our TOAX system here, so the latency is, um, is, is really short. But one thing that's really interesting to do, and I would encourage you, know, you, you all to do this, is just get in the habit of looking at their web page. It's pretty fascinating to, uh, to watch the probabilities increase. And they also have, you, you can display the NWS you know, warnings on that page. And it's, it's pretty crazy to watch the probability shoot up above 80%. And then about 10 minutes later, the, you know, the, the little box comes out and the, and, the, and the warning was issued. So I guess just purely anecdotally looking at that um, over several months, it seems pretty darn promising, that's for sure. Thanks, Dan. Well, John, uh, thank you uh, for your presentation today. We sure appreciate it. And um, would, would you be willing to uh, share that PowerPoint with us? Yeah, certainly. Okay. Um, yeah. Yep, you send it to Jeff or myself. That's fine.